And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us straight from the land of 10,000 lakes and the land of shitty-ass sports teams. Sorry, couldn't resist. <laughs> and the and the head honcho of Lone Colossus Games, currently kickstarting Injuries and Vile Deeds, not to be confused with the Book of Vile Darkness, thank God. The one and the one and only the man better known as Josh Rosing. Not to be confused and that's Rosing, not Rosen for my Minis Minnesota listeners. Yeah. Uh thanks for having me. Yeah, I had, I had to get I had to get one I had to get a few um local jokes out of my system. <laughs> Cuz I get the feeling people have misread mis misread it as Rosen at least once. Oh, definitely. And there, there are people with that actual last name too, so it doesn't make any any less confusing. <laughs> no, I remember. I remember when I, I remember when I was when I was on vacation in Europe, and um, I had a few people asking if I was related to Mirko Krokop. I'm not. <laughs> um, of course, if I use the name Mildred, everybody thinks I'm from Sweden. I'm not. And I have a I have ancestors in Sweden, but I, but no. Um, so I'd like to start at the humble beginnings, as I often do around here. Well, when I'm not drinking. Walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. Yeah, um, I think my very first introduction was sometime in elementary school. There was a D and D club uh, at the school run by one of the teachers um, and I didn't have time to uh, to play in it because I was busy doing uh, music but my brother my twin brother was uh, in the in the club and he ran a like one-on-one -on -one game for me um, I think this I'm I don't know for sure but I, I want to say it was like second edition d and um, and then after that, it was a while. Uh, we picked up the 3.5 rule book sometime in middle school, got a bunch of used ones uh, online, and started playing at that point with some other friends. Um, played 3.5 for a while uh, and tried out a few other systems. I think just Shadowrun before college. That was the only other non D&D system that I played before then. But how many pounds of D6s? <laughs> Uh, I actually, I don't think we had, I want to say a friend of mine who owned the Shadowrun rulebook had the D6s, and we shared those, and then I later bought a, you know, 3066 set to play Shadowrun, and then never, never ended up playing it again. Um, that, <laughs> um, that's because you didn't have enough, you didn't have enough D6s. Uh, clearly. <laughs> um... And uh, yeah, so since then I've I've played a bunch of other systems: um, Savage Worlds, Fate, the uh, Fantasy Flight, Star Wars system, um, Mistborn. Mm -hmm. There's a few other smaller ones. Uh, I like to do like kind of in between. I I always come back to D and D, and I really like Fifth Edition. Um, but I always like to in between campaigns do. Uh, you know, short adventures or one shots in other systems in part because I like learning them, but also uh, I always feel like there's, there are things in other systems that inspire me to make new content for 5e or to change the way that I run the game. Um, and so I've found that my ability to DM games has improved a lot just by playing other systems, even if I do always come back to 5e. I appreciate you confessing to me that you are a forever GM. <laughs> I really like DMing. Um, uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's not like I'm. It's not like I'm one to talk, to the point where I've considered doing a um, forever GM support group. You know, G, you know, GMs anonymous or something like that. <laughs> and it's something that I appreciate because there's always there's always a 
there's always an interesting difference of mind different of design mindset between the between those who experiment and those who are one system lifers I'm not saying either is better or worse they're just different yeah that makes sense now given that you mentioned ta um taking insp taking inspiration for content from your experiences with other games i know that you i know that you mentioned um, certain video games and and, cer and certain non-tabletop productions on the Kickstarter page, but I'm curious if there are any games in particular that inspired the direction you want to take Injuries and Vile Deeds. Yeah, um... I don't know so much about, like, from this point onward, but certainly the, the original uh, injury system idea came from the Fantasy Flight Star Wars system i don't know if you've played that but they I have, have i have i've um yeah. i covered it during a star wars special a few a few years ago okay i didn't awesome yeah i didn't cover one of them per se but i cover but i covered all three main lines yeah so for anyone i guess for anyone listening who isn't familiar with it um that system has an injuries table that's uh, in some ways similar to what you might expect to find online for like 5e and other D&D games where it's just a percentile table, but where I think they did a much better job than say like your average random injury table online is well one, none of them are really good <laughs> there's never anything good that happens from being injured um, and then two, they go f not just from like 0 or 1 to 100, it goes from 1 to 150 and so in order to get those like really bad injuries, you have to already be injured or you have to be hit with a weapon that's likely to give you a terrible injury. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was kind of where it started. I just transplanted that into 5e. Uh, that was like three years ago. Uh, played a uh, campaign using those rules and continuously updating them. And what I didn't like about them still was that you could roll... You know, if you had like plus 20, you could still roll anywhere from a minor injury at like 20 all the way up to a major injury at like 120, right? And in the Star Wars game, that was fine because your max hit points were like 14 or something. And like a shot could easily do like seven to nine damage in one hit. And so you getting an injury, like it was just bonus on top of the damage. It was like. It, the amount of damage you were taking was always going to be at least somewhat corresponding to how bad the injury was. Mm -hmm. Just because, uh, you know, it was always going to be a lot of damage. Um, in D&D, it doesn't make sense for someone to take, like, you know, five damage out of 50 hit points and suddenly be losing an arm. Uh, so that's where the, um, the different severities come in. So I changed the system to have multiple different severities of injury. You have different injury thresholds where if the damage meets a certain threshold, you take an injury of that severity. Generally, generally for player characters, when you're conscious, it's always going to be a what's called a setback, which is the lowest severity, just because, hey, you weren't knocked out, you're still up. Clearly, it wasn't that bad. Um, and hit points are, uh, I, I think, one of the benefits of this system or these systems is that you get to differentiate between hit points and physical harm which is something that I think the game's rules used to encourage thinking of as like hit points are literally just how many hits you can take. It's not, and by hits, we mean mechanical hits, not like physical blows from your enemy. It's your stamina, it's your luck. It's, you know, how long you can fend off that last blow. And a lot of people now take hit points as literal, like it's how many meat points I have. I can take, you know, yeah. I can get hit like 500 times for one point of it. Well, okay. Uh, that's a lot, but a uh, hundred times, you know, as a barbarian, maybe even at like lower levels, especially if you're raging uh, and it's like, okay, yeah, to a certain extent, you could have some scratches and cuts and things. Yeah. But none of them are going to be like, okay, I have an arrow sticking out of my arm. No, that's, I don't care how tough you are. That's going to hurt. <laughs> it's going to cause problems. Um, and so, yeah. So I think having, having the injuries helps differentiate that. Um, but yeah, as far as like, where I'm going in the future, uh, I think I'm kind of in new territory here as far as the systems I'm familiar with. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. 
to be honest, if somebody were to play word association with me when it comes to wound tables and fantasy role playing games, my mind immediately goes to either Rollmaster or Warhammer Fantasy. And grant, granted, in the granted in the case of in the case of Rollmaster, that was the first and um, was also the was also not exactly friendly. Um, it was also a bit is also a bit nuts. I often bring up Rollmaster whenever somebody tells me that um, that something like say fi something like say five E or Shadowrun is too complicated. <laughs> um, if I have to if I have to pull out the glasses and be Morpheus for a for a day just to tell them how deep the rabbit hole goes, I will certainly do that. And of course, I have months. Of course, there's always monstrosities like the hero systems, um, character creation rules. I could bring I could bring up if somebody wants to really complain about um, 5e being too complicated. Uh, but when I do. But what I do find in, what I do find interesting is because this is a this is a trend that I've been seeing with a lot of third party um, devel development a push towards adding more tactical elements into D and D in some cases more tactical elements and in some cases more customization now given that given that given that direction that you're going um how easier or tr or tricky was it to was it to implement things that would integrate that direction with the with just the base classes for instance yeah sure um so there's in terms of like the the you know feats and spells items that sort of thing that are in the book um, I'm pretty used to designing those for my own games, and I published a fair, uh, fair bit of uh, monsters at this point too. So, like, that's not hard for me to incorporate. I think the rules are really open to expansion in those directions. Adding new systems to Five E, I think, is where things get tricky. Um, and so the the injury systems, it there are certainly times where I, I wished, okay, well, and. At some point, I probably will make a new system that is, you know, dark for the dark fantasy the aesthetic that I'm kind of going for with this book. Um, but because I do mainly play Five E, and you know, I'm that's I'm making it for Five E. Um, but yeah, so that there have been times where I, I kind of you know wish I didn't have to deal with hit points or the way damage works in Five E. Um, be, because yeah, you have these combinations where. Uh, say if you have like a well and these are also kind of edge cases right but like a barbarian rogue can reduce their damage that they take once per round by like a quarter if they're raging and it's the right damage type and they use uncanny dodge um, and so you can end up with certain characters feeling like they're almost impossible to injure but I also think that that does kind of play into the um aesthetic that you kind of go for when you're playing a barbarian you're super tough you're gonna be hard to hurt right um when you do get hurt that's a sign that <laughs> things are real bad <laughs> um or you know someone hit you with a, with fire instead and you're not a bear totem or whatever um so yeah it, f but but the the way i kind of went about it initially was literally just looking at you know mathematically i i I know a fair bit of math, and so I, I like to go to just kind of basic, um, you know, plots of of how things scale with level and and stuff when I'm designing. Um, and so I, I literally just went like, okay, here's your average hit points for barbarian, average hit points for fighter, etc. Over levels, and then you know looked at damage thresholds, looked at you know how much damage your enemies were going to be dealing it, you know, at most levels, what felt right um, for the right. Uh, numbers and then similarly uh, how much damage output can characters have and how many hit points do monsters usually have at certain levels um, and so I could, that's kind of how I started and then of course through actual games and play things get tweaked a lot mm -hmm. um, but it gave me a good you know initial starting point yeah now you ended up using the you end up using in bold, in bold cinematic tactical encounters on the Kickstarter page. And what I'm curious about is for you 
in your interpretation, what makes an encounter cinematic? What makes an encounter tactical? Because there's a, there's a lot of definitions that people can have when it comes to that kind of thing. And sorry about that. Discord decided to mess with me again. Um, what I was saying is, given the given the terms cinematic and tactical, and how those can have a whole lot of definition, depending on who you ask, I'm curious how you interpret that that in terms of combat. Yeah, absolutely. Um... So cinematic, uh, or I guess I, I've used that um, uh, interchangeably with descriptive. Uh, I think, at, at least in my games, my players are uh, often, and I'm the same way too sometimes when I'm playing, is it, 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 it can feel like, okay, well, we're in combat, I should just think about my abilities and and if you're a martial character whose abilities are literally just, I can make an attack and roll some damage, sometimes it does just come down to, okay, I'm going to move up here, I'm going to roll a couple attacks against this you know, target, roll some damage, and then your turn's over. Um, and even if you are being descriptive, often there's not a lot that like actually comes out of that. So if you're like, oh, I want to specifically do, like, I don't know, target their arm, try and make it harder for them to attack me, there's no mechanical way for you to do that. Um, and then tactics, obviously there, if you're playing with a grid, there's, you know, a certain amount of tactics in terms of where you're positioned and, you know, how your enemies are positioned and where you go relative to them. But again, you know, for martial characters, especially, you don't have a lot of choices for things that you can do. Battle masters are an exception, but you know, your like champion fighter or like your average barbarian doesn't have a lot of options of things to do in combat. It's usually just move up and attack and, and you know, try and pick where you're standing. It's funny you meant it's funny you mentioned that given how um on my podcast my bro my brother Zan and I have talked at length about about the reputation of the fighter as Babby's first character. Which right. is a reputation that's that um isn't exactly fair, but it's one that because of how because of how how broad the class is, and and certain other traditions. It's one that it's one that's inevitable. Really good arguments for why rogue should be everyone's first class, especially in five e, because they have a lot of action economy, um, and so like you really learn how all of the different actions work and how you can take advantage of them, um, but. Yeah, uh, but yeah. So I I I think uh, the the injury system for like from the player side and being only being able to inflict injuries on their enemies gives them a lot more options. Um, and so you can have you can literally have a tactic of oh we're fighting a flying creature it has wings let's take its wings out like force it to the ground um, and that you know you could have the DM, you know DMs previously obviously could have come up with something on the fly for it, but I think it's nice to have something codified that everyone kind of looks at and is, yeah, we're going to use these systems. And then suddenly all the players are going, oh, what can we, you know, what can we do with this? You know, what, what are we fighting next? How should we prepare for it? What kind of weaknesses does it have? What strengths does it have? What should we, you know, can we remove some of its resistances? Can we remove its, you know, can we try and prevent the dragon from using its breath weapon by like, you know, attacking its throat or something like you get all of these new thoughts about what you can do. And then, of course, descriptive comes into that, too, where I would, at least as a DM, encourage the players, don't just tell me what you're trying to injure. Tell me how you're trying to inflict that injury, right? Or if you have players who are already being super descriptive, now you can reward them with, oh, yeah, you told me you were going to go after the dragon's wings. Now you're not just doing damage. You're actually, like, if you do enough damage, it can't fly for a little while. Or, you know, if you do a lot of damage, it literally just can't fly because you cut a wing off or something. Mm -hmm. And I'm, gu I'm guessing that because of that, when you realized you had created an injury system, I'm, ge I'm guessing that you came to the realization pretty quickly that, that this was going to have a domino effect with a lot of other aspects, including how monster design works. 
monsters in the book, for example, have uh, something to do with the injury system. Um, obviously, not every monster needs to. Uh, you can, you know, just having the injury threshold on hand for its hit points just means that people can inflict injuries on them. But I do think it's really flavorful that some monsters might be easier to injure than others in particular ways. Some might uh, need injuries to be killed, for example. So I, ha I introduce a new uh like zombie template in the book um that you know you could replace the or in it use in addition in addition to if you feel like it um the trait that they have that you know when they hit zero hit points they make a constitution save and see if they stay up um you could replace that with they have to have you have to hit them with a death blow to kill them so and, and in order to hit a creature with a death blow it needs at least you know, X number of injuries, uh, and then it becomes vulnerable. The next, and then every once it's vulnerable, every time you injure it, there's a chance it just dies. Um, and so, like you could imagine, there are creatures that if you don't kill them with a death blow, then something bad happens. Or if you, uh, the the fallen, for example. So uh, Zaphyrex, the Lord of the Fallen, is one of these. He controls <clears throat> um, the others. Uh, they're inspired by the Reavers from. Firefly, and so you can imagine that uh, the more injured they get, the 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 uh, uh, more energized they become, the more you know effective they are because they really enjoy that pain, um, and so they actually you you can't avoid injuring them because they specifically open themselves up to injury. So if you deal enough damage, they take an injury and then they get a little buff. Um, so I like I like you know uh, it, it's been fun designing monsters with. Um, these sorts of abilities, but uh, yeah, there's there's always there's all sorts of things that you can uh, do with the injury system. Mm -hmm. Now, since you mentioned not being a fan of hit points for the reasons we've already outlined, I'm curious what your thoughts are on cr on criticals and how you plan on implementing criticals with this injury system. Yeah. Um... I, mean, I think critical hits from the perspective of a from hit of, of hit points being uh, stamina for example a critical hit would be something that was really hard to avoid right but you still managed to avoid it assuming it didn't cause an injury um, in terms of the system I think generally speaking if you look at the damage output that characters and monsters have if they're trying to injure someone and they roll a crit they're going to succeed in injuring because they do enough damage on that crit um, on average, obviously, you know, depending on the way you're doing your crits, uh, if you rolled super low, yeah, maybe, you know, you won't, you won't see that injury happen. Um, but if you have a monster that's, I don't know, using like a, a giant, like a hill giant, right. It does like 3d8 plus five damage with one of its attacks. If it gets a crit, it's almost certainly going to injure someone. Um, so yeah, I think, I think they, it'll play in well, um, but there isn't anything uh, specifically written. There might be, I can't remember, I, I've written most of the uh, 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 items and such. There might be an item that uh, like auto-inflicts an injury on a crit, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be a magic item. Yeah. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to the player-facing end of things, um, within, the within the book, do you have plans for any... So, any subclasses for the ba for the base classes? Yep, um, there will be a subclass for every base class, so twelve subclasses. Uh, um, given that, given that, I'd like to I'd like to go down the the um, class list and get and um, get basically what basically what you what um you guys have pl you guys have planned for. Th for that particular um that particular class um sure so hang on, let me... sorry about sorry about that the where i had where i'd put everything was so let me start at the top barbarian yeah so the barbarian subclass is currently called the blood reaver mm -hmm. um they get a uh, bloodthirst rage, so while raging, they um, 
uh, ha find it easier to uh, injure creatures that are already um, at less than half their hit points. Mm -hmm. uh, very much inspired by the bloodied mechanic from 4e. I really like that term, and I think we should make it a mechanic in 5e for sure. Um, uh, and their uh, their kind of capstone ability is a uh, like supernatural bite attack, so they can uh, it kind of um, I guess uh, it might feel a little werewolf like, but essentially you can uh, grab someone and you know bite them with uh, fangs, and then uh, on a, on another turn, if you maintain that grapple, you can tear their flesh out and give them the torn artery. Uh, special injury which does a lot of damage um initially and then they also take uh ongoing damage from that mm -hmm. um bard <clears throat> so bard is the college of violence um there it's it's a sort of melee spell casting uh um focused class uh, subclass the uh essentially when when they uh uh, hit a creature with a spell attack or th or if they um have a creature fail a saving throw against a spell that that you cast then the next uh turn your melee weapon attack is going to do more damage um and so they're and then they also have some things uh with injuries they can use their uh inspiration die to reduce uh injury thresholds so um they're they're a cross between support and then also just uh, violence, obviously. Um, their capstone ability is uh, not done yet, but temporarily called Sanguine Revelry. Um, and essentially, whenever you, they inflict an injury on a living creature or a creature with blood, so like a vampire, um, they can make a perform check as a bonus action uh, and, you know... Uh, uh do a dance essentially <laughs> um spraying the uh blood around um and for every injury threshold you meet from that uh you know when you inflict that injury um then you get a bonus to that check and then based on the check your allies get a bonus to attack and damage rolls mm -hmm. so next would be the cleric so for Cleric, we have the Slaughter Domain. Um, it is focused around uh, things related to um, butchery, so or at least you know flavor-wise. So their um, <clears throat> their second level channel divinity is called Ready the Abattoir. Uh, they reduce the uh, injury thresholds of creatures in a large area around them. Um, so that's a little bit more of a support uh, role that they have. Um, but they're also capable of uh, allowing an ally to heal when they uh, inflict an injury. Um, and their capstone, uh, Bloody Abattoir, uh, enhances the uh, Ready the Abattoir um, channel divinity, which uh, causes it to deal uh, necrotic damage as well. Um, and also inflicts injuries on any creature that that damage meets their newly reduced injury threshold. So um, it gives you a very powerful... I really like the uh, Channel Divinity um, powers in 5e. I think that they're... Um, they're, really, they're really nice from a flavor, flavor standpoint, and they're also kind of... They can be like a, a, a encounter power, essentially, from 4e, where they're a bit... Uh, more specialized, though. Um, so they're almost like their own spell in, in and of themselves. And so enhancing it um, at the, that 17th level ability makes it extremely powerful, but of course still only usable a few times per rest. Mm -hmm. So next would be the Druid. Sorry, the Druid. Had, had to get a Mystery of the Druids joke out of there, out of there somewhere. <laughs> So Druid is the Circle of the Grim Harvest. Um, I the, Druids flavor-wise should be using like sickles and scythes, and as far as I know, there isn't really a good like you know melee weapon oriented Druid. So this is that um, they gain the ability to take on the form of the Grim Harvest. Um, it's that uses their wild shape uh, and. 
essentially turns them into a uh you know melee oriented um combatant they're uh they they are gain the ability to um when they hit a creature with an attack they can implant a the seed of a bloodthorn vine in their flesh mm-hmm. um which gives that creature a stack of bloody harvest uh and then later on they can use an ability called reap the bloody harvest uh, where you will those seeds to grow, which saps energy from them and gives it to you. Uh, and then their um, their capstone ability, uh, called the herd, allows them to uh, enter that form uh, more easily, costs them fewer wild shapes to do it. Um, and then also whenever they reduce a creature that has those stacks of bloody harvest in them, um, to zero hit points, you can transfer all of those stacks to another creature for free. So you never like miss out on the chance to steal um uh energy from a creature just because it's been dropped. Mm-hmm. So the feeder. Sorry, the fighter. Fighter is champion of pain. Um this one's definitely still a work in progress. Uh my first design for it was much too strong. Um as I found out through some playtesting. So it's gonna need some more. Um but essentially uh it takes some inspiration from the actual champion. Um so their weapon attacks score critical hits against injured targets more easily. Um but also they are the only character that is capable of inflicting multiple injuries in the same turn that's where it got uh really hard to balance um initially there was no limit on how many injuries they could inflict um and so now i'm uh you know kind of playing around with how many times you can do that uh they're also the only characters that can inflict multiple death blows in the same turn um namely because they can inflict multiple injuries in the same turn uh with attacks so um that they are very good at inflicting injuries and also very good at uh, killing creatures um, with those injuries. Mm-hmm. So next, I've, uh, obviously this is one I'd be looking forward to because, well, my <laughs> name's sake, but the monk. <laughs> yes, uh, Way of the Twisted Spirit. Um, I really liked designing. I really like designing for monk in general. I have, uh, I think two or three well i just released one uh, subclass recently and um i have like two more that i'm working on but this one uh has a a upgrade to stunning strike essentially um called an agonizing strike uh there's a new um condition in the book sickened uh and so this upgrades the stun to sickened or rather adds uh uh, sickened to that so once they stop being stunned then they're still sickened for a while as they're overwhelmed with pain um, they get a, a new saving throw at the end of each of their turns to end that of course but um, mm-hmm. and then their capstone ability torture the bones of the earth um, they gain access to the life force of the world around them and they can twist it causing suffering to all life nearby uh, as an action they scream creating a localized earth tremor, tremor, which ripples with psychic pain. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a large radius uh, centered on you, uh, and every enemy in that radius um, has to make a saving throw, take psychic damage, and be stunned, and then be sickened uh, after that. Um, So they're very focused on causing pain uh, and using pain to control their enemies. Mm Mm-hmm. So next would be the Paladin. Yeah, Paladin um, is the Oath of Corruption, or if you want a more good aligned character, you could call it the Oath of Rebirth. Um, essentially, they the flavor for it is taking something and changing what it is. So their Oath spells are, you know, like Charm Person, Crown of Madness, um, Modify Memory, uh anything to change uh you know corrupt something against its natural uh order of things i guess um the rebirth would be okay this uh for example you might say okay this organization is terrible let's change it from within corrupt it against its intentions and then turn it into something that is you know good for us um at the same time you could be an evil character who goes oh 
here's a really, you know, let's take this like charity organization and corrupt it into this, you know, awful, like, you know, you know, full, fully like for profit, uh, stealing from the poor type thing. Um, so that's the flavor for that. Um, their channel divinity, uh, is a charm effect. Um, and, uh, Essentially, it's not exactly the same as like a crowd of madness, but it does turn them hostile to their allies and uh, allied to their enemies. Um, so very similar, but they still have kind of that freedom of will as opposed to you must attack like the nearest creature or whatever that does. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> their other, uh, then their their capstone uh, avatar of corruption um, gives them. Uh, a lot of uh, kind of just general upgrades for a minute, enhancing some of their other abilities uh, that they get through the subclass and um, letting them uh, corrupt other creatures. Mm -hmm. So this brings us to the most snake bitten class out of all the base classes, the Ranger. Yeah, so the Ranger's subclass is the Bloodthorn Warrior. Um, the uh, kind of central flavor for it is somewhat related to the druid. Um, there's going to be some NPCs in the book that are uh, re that represent these, so they're both kind of tied to this uh, con location concept that I came up with, the Bloodthorn Grove, um, which you know could be like a sacred site for druids or just like a protected area. Um, essentially, as a Bloodthorn warrior, you have uh, made a pact or, you know, uh, been given a blessing by nature spirits that live in that grove. Um, and so you get a number of kind of thorn oriented, uh, or, you know, thorn flavored abilities. Um, you can, uh, kind of a minor thing they get is the ability to sense the general direction and, and distance to the, the deadliest threat, uh, to them, uh, within a hundred feet. Uh, as long as they're outside, um, and uh, they're they are very uh, two up and fighting oriented, um, so I think it's uh, one of the challenges with this subclass as I'm testing it. It has been uh, figuring out how to make the bonus action um, important beyond just is taking another attack, or how to enhance that second attack uh, to make it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So, next would be the rogue. The king of gank. And uh, the, the rogue subclass is called the bloodletter. Um, they uh, gain the ability to... Um, sneak attack on attacks opportunity and also uh which is important because um that means they could potentially uh cause an injury uh on it on an attack opportunity um because that sneak damage attack damage is usually the way they're going to be inflicting the injuries um they have the option to uh reduce some of their sneak attack damage um to just inflict an injury uh of bleeding so you can cause uh you know, a slash and um, and and cause the, the creature to take damage every round, uh, based on how many dice you remove. Uh, and their capstone essentially makes them uh, much better at killing uh, severely injured creatures. So whenever they attempt to injure a vulnerable creature, they get bonus sneak attack damage um, based well. But at a minimum amount, and then additional dice based on how many injuries they have uh, beyond that vulnerable threshold of, of injuries. So they're going to deal even more damage, which is going to increase the likelihood that they inflict an injury, which increases the likelihood that the creature dies from a death blow. Mm -hmm. So next would be the Sorcerer. The uh, sorcerer is the nightmare soul sorcerer. Mm -hmm. um, they are, as the name suggests, uh, focused on nightmares and uh, causing fear, and uh, you know, fear through pain or just fear through uh, psychic 
uh, effects. Um, they can uh, every time they they uh, wake up, essentially, it's uh, their the the flavor is their nightmares prepare them for the day ahead. So when they finish a long rest, uh, they can choose a damage type to uh, increase their injury thresholds against that damage type. Um, if you know what you're going up against, that could be super helpful. Otherwise, a little bit of a roulette. I guess the physical damage types are always a, a safe thing to choose. Uh, obviously, as a sorcerer, you have fewer hit points, and so uh, getting that bonus is uh, a nice little defensive buff uh, against injuries. Um, I really like their the name for their capstone, Dream the Bloody Nightmare. Um, they can assault the minds of uh, creatures within range, and uh, if they fail a saving throw, they are plunged into a waking nightmare. Um, they are immobilized, they have their injury thresholds reduced, they're frightened of you for a minute, um, and uh, whenever they suffer an injury, you can use your reaction to injure them again. Uh, so it's very powerful, it's a once per day feature, um, and there are multiple chances for them to uh, break out of it, of course. So <clears throat> then we have the of uh, the other warlock the other um c casting class that gets a lot of play um uh, warlocks. Yeah, so warlocks uh the otherworldly patron soul render. Um they this is the uh sort of like essence thief. Uh that's the name of their uh first level ability. By inflicting injuries, they gain minor bonuses. There's a limit to how many of those they can have, but they last for a little while. Um, and, uh, yeah, as they level up, they'll get better at, um, inflicting damage directly to the souls of their enemies, and then also just better at stealing that essence. Um, the, uh, stretch goal that we have for, uh, 35,000, uh, is for a, uh, monster called the Soul Flayer, um, and I think it would be a really perfect patron for this, uh, subclass. Um, and then we have the wizard. And there's my Discworld joke for the day. <laughs> uh, so the School of Nosorology, they are students of pain. Um, they're better at learning spells that inflict injuries um, or that require attack rolls because attack rolls are, uh, allow you to naturally inflict injuries uh, without any sort of feats or anything. Um, they are, uh, better at, or they, they're able to inflict, uh, longer duration injuries, uh, with their spells. Um, and the, the difficulty to remove those injuries increases. Um, they're able to link, uh, creatures, uh, yeah, psyches together so that, um, or even beyond uh, Psyche, they're, they're able to physically link creatures together um, so that harm inflicted on one is inflicted on the other. Um, and they're also uh, capable of amplifying um, suffering. So if a creature has already been injured, uh, you can uh, increase, or once a, a creature is injured, you can increase the uh, severity of that injury. Um, but that's a, kind of a you know X times per day type ability. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, some of the classes that I've that I've gone over have their own have their own little have their own little ability um, pools, and I'm cu I'm curious if some of those are going to get expanded. Like say, just for just for just for example's sake, um, bat um battle are do you plan on expanding bat um maneuvers for the battle master? A good question. Um, no, I, I don't currently have plans to do that. I think that's, a, that's an interesting idea. Um, a lot of them do add damage, so obviously, you know, if you're trying to inflict an injury and you use a maneuver, you're more likely to succeed in that. Um, but I think uh, they're also, you know, the maneuvers are are uh, there's a fair number of them, and it would be difficult, I think, to find uh, new. Uh, maneuvers. I, I, you know, you could make one that would maybe make it easier to inflict an injury, but at the same time, like I said, they they do more damage. So um, there is kind of already that as a as a feature of them. Mm -hmm. 
and in in the same in that same vein, um, have has has there been any thought about exp about expanding things like meta magic or eldritch invocations? Yeah, I might make some new invocations. I ha I haven't gone that far yet. Um, I also need to keep in mind that I have limits on pages in the book, and if I expand too much, then <laughs> kind of start adding pages. Um, so yeah, I, I could see potentially adding more uh, invocations. I think there's always there there are often there are invocations added with uh, with warlock patrons just because um, a lot of them are very unique, and so they like to add um, kind of individually targeted uh, invocations. Um, Meta magic uh, is also a, a good uh, question. I haven't um, haven't gotten that far yet. I think the uh, once the subclasses have more uh, play testing, then um, then I can start thinking about adding those uh, smaller features as well. Uh, and it's that's cer that's certainly a fair that's that is well, certainly a fair point. And I'm guessing that in addition, you're also considering putting in feats. Yep, um, feats. there's a there's a whole list of feats. Um, I forget how many. Uh, but yeah, there's a there's a fair number of feats in here. There's a, a lot of spells, um, items as well. Mm -hmm. And I know, yeah, I know you. I obviously with uh, magic items, that's 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 one the, that's um that's almost a matter of course. One other thing that I find interesting that you have that you have planned is. The whole is the um, expansion on villains that you're putting in. Uh, yeah, with a set uh, of a set of realized NPCs, I believe it was. Yeah, essentially. Um, so some of the so there there will be NPCs in the book. Some of them will be you know generic. You might have like uh, uh, there will be a couple a couple of uh, organizations, for example. So I have a blood cult, just you know generic blood cult. Um, they have a, their blood cult commander and blood cult officer and NPCs. Um, but uh, some of them, uh, so like Altaira is shown on the campaign page, um, will be like a fully developed. So all of them will have like, you know, the, your standard description and, and lore and such. Um, but there will be some unique NPCs uh, like Altaira that will have like a personality description, um, you know, specific physical description, uh, and then plot hooks. I think are probably where you're where you're getting at. Where um, there will be some suggestions for, hey, this character kind of you know does these things, or like these are some ways that the character the the uh, player characters might learn about the NPC or things that they might hire you know the party to do that sort of thing. Um, so when you see the character and you're like, oh, they look really cool. I want to run, you know, run them in my game, or at least include them in in the lore of my game. Then you also have a way of introducing the party to them. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd one other thing I I um I know I know that there's things like plot hooks, but do you also plan on putting in th things like a a um, recommended a recommended a recommended adversary party or so, or something like that basically the the uh, recommended groups that you would sometimes see in the monster manual in fourth uh you mean like uh uh you know you would find you know these npcs together for example or... yeah it was bas it was basically building a package it was basically building an xp package of um, sure. vi of villains and I'm just using villains loosely, ad adversaries, yeah. enemies, mooks, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, there are some uh, there are some monsters, uh, actually, for sure that I've I've written uh, that in where you know you might have one monster that is related to another monster, and so it'd be like, okay, when you fight this, they're usually going to come with a couple of these other lesser ones, um, uh, NPCs. Uh, you know, probably would would be done uh, similarly. I don't know that I have a plan to because everyone's group is different, um, and so I, I kind of trust other DMs to know better <laughs> than I would uh, as to like what you know how how many of each to to include in in a in a combat encounter. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to you know add an adventure, then then I would 
absolutely be uh, saying how many enemies and how to adjust that for different um, different parties. But uh, yeah, beyond that, I um, I think there's they can, it can be useful, but there is somewhat limited use to putting together groups. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, um, how how did you end up meeting up with the developers of My Sound Delve? Since that's yeah. one other fa that's one other factor in this. Yeah. So uh, Christian uh, from My My Sound Delve uh, just saw the, saw the project and was uh, you know really excited about it um, and uh, wanted to see if I was open to sharing. Um, some of the, the injury names with him essentially to use as inspiration for sounds. And so as part of that, um, he's yeah making some sounds that'll be available to, uh, to backers for free. Mm -hmm. Which is, de which is definitely, definitely very nice. Cause, um, as, as funny as it is to have people do funny noises to try and impl to try and replicate effects, that's a talent that takes a bit of practice. It does. Yeah. And and comfort too. Like you can be good at making sound effects and then not feel comfortable doing it. And that's, I don't know if that's where I fall in or if I'm just not comfortable and not good at it. Not everybody just... is Michael Winslow. I'll put it that way. Yeah. Now, with that with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a total page count? Yeah. So the book is is uh, initially aimed at 150 pages. Um, obviously there might be some expansion to that with some of the stretch goals that we're meeting. Um, but, uh, I will say currently the Google doc of all of the information is about 160 pages and that'll shrink a bit with, uh, you know, formatting into layout, but then you also add in all the art and stuff. So, um, I think we're, we're right around there currently. Um, but as some of the, you know, some of the stretch goals are for more uh, monsters and NPCs, so there might be a couple of pages added here and there. Uh, which I I can I can certainly see that, and you're di and you're getting and given how close you're getting to 30k at the time of this recording, uh, st the stretch goals are always going to make things interesting. Now, with that, with that in with that in mind, is some of the material leaning into le leaning into a? I guess not necessarily a set, not necessarily a setting, but almost like almost a gazetteer. When it comes to that, when it comes to the style of fantasy that this that this book is going for. Um. Yeah. It's well. It's definitely dark fantasy oriented. Um. I think there's a obviously there's a fair bit that you can use generically, um, but some of the things like uh, you know the conjure blood elemental spell is probably going to be, or a lot of the the subclasses that I described, right? They're probably going to fit more in a dark fantasy game than a like uh, you know noble bright setting, right? Mm -hmm. um, but it depends on your game. You could have a you could have a you know noble noble right adjacent where the the uh, players are you know heroes and nothing terrible really ever happens to them but they still fight through like you know kind of terrible situations and but everything comes out okay in the end that sounds more like grim bright sure that'd be grim bright yeah which i think is i think is an angle that a lot of people um overlook when it comes to its potential Now, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window? Not a date per se, but a ballpark. Right. Yeah, so there's a I guess there's a couple of um couple of couple of, of answers to that question. Um all of the backers are going to get the core uh currently like current playtest version of the core rules um pretty much as soon as the Kickstarter funds clear, so I imagine that'll be mid-July. Um I think it usually takes a couple of weeks for that to happen. Um, and then as chapters get completed, um, they'll be released as well digitally before the full PDF is available. Um, 
and then once the full PDF is ready, then that'll get sent out. Um, and then of course, uh, physical will, will come after that currently shooting for about, uh, like next May. Um, but I also know that paper shortages and everything, you know, you know, it's, you know, it depends on, on, uh, how quickly art comes together and how quickly the, uh, editing happens. Um, so that things can be sent off to printers and then sit in a queue for three months uh, before they get printed and shipped. <laughs> yeah. And I, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing how it develops and how my players are probably going to die horribly. <laughs> it, you know, can, you know, it's, it's a case of you have, you have two choices, either quick and painless or slow and horrible. You have selected slow and horrible. Yeah, that's um, that's one thing I, I I also really like about the injury systems um, is that it, they tend to encourage one side to flee before they're actually dead, uh, because if you're injured, you're not fighting at full capacity, and if you're if most of you aren't fighting at full capacity and you haven't won yet, chances are you want to run away, um, and so when the injuries get really bad, it's usually by player's choice. They've decided to stick around in combat or stick around at the risky part of combat, uh, you know, in melee, for example, um, longer than maybe was advisable, but that was their decision, right? So that's one of these things with, with the scaling injuries. And like I said, while you're con when you're conscious, you're always going to get that lowest severity injury, but you only have one slot of each type. So once you have a, a setback, the next injury you take is dangerous. The next one you take is higher. So... Um, you know, you can be doing fine hit points wise if you keep getting healed and you're still conscious, but you can get those injuries and decide that you need to run away. Or, you know, you might decide, well, yeah, we got injured, but time is not on our side. We have to keep pushing. We can't spend the two days or, you know, more that it takes to fully recover from all these injuries. So let's keep going. And mm -hmm. yeah, maybe the next injury is going to be real bad. Yeah. And. And like like I said, I'll be I'll be looking forward to seeing how this develops because this this is another this is another notch on a on a trend that I've been keeping a close eye on. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> well, thanks for having me. It's been great. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present... My name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>